So, so on, behalf of the, on, on behalf of my friends from Kampala, I have to help you guys here. Kenyans, there's a thing we do. We say Champala. That's not how Ugandans say it. Please, don't embarrass me, Father. In, in, in Luganda, it's K-I, that's Chi. So Chigali. But K-A is Ka. So whenever you say Champala, you look like a Kenyan. Just tell your neighbor, he just saved your life. He saved you from embarrassment. I had to represent my, I had to represent my Ugandan brothers and sisters and sons and daughters and help us put that together. <laughs> this is what happens when we become international. We have to speak in tongues. Amen. Amen. All right. Please be seated for a second and uh, want to jump in. Uh, we just, uh, so Pastor Goldman was literally, he was here just for that talk. And so in the middle of this talk, he's actually going to be leaving to the airport as he heads back to uh, Lagos. So can we just appreciate him one more time, everybody? <laughs> Such a good man. And we're so grateful. We're so, so grateful that he was willing to do this. Wow. So, um, yeah, it's good, it's good to have friends. It's good to, it's good to have friends. Good to have friends. Yeah. Amen. You know, we've... we've um, We've been going through this transformation. Like I said, it's a two-year, it's been a two-year journey with the church. It's more been a, like a, for me, it's been more like a maybe five or six-year journey uh, into the culture that the Lord was leading us to. And if you've ever read the book Fearless, um, you're going to see my story or my account of how this dissatisfaction started. How many of you have read the book Fearless? Let me just see a show of hands. Quite a few of you. So in the book, I kind of detail, and I, at the end of the book, I talk about some of the dissatisfaction that I was feeling. That I was actually in the space where everybody thought Mavuno was, the most, was a very successful church, but I was experiencing a sense of holy dissatisfaction. And the thing I began to understand is that our culture would not help us achieve our vision. You can have a fantastic vision, but what the people who do leadership tell you is that culture eats vision for breakfast. So it doesn't matter what you think you're going to achieve. If your culture doesn't help you achieve it, you will never achieve it. And that's, for me... The, the, the spiritual story is how I tell it, that God led me into a sense of dissatisfaction that led me to begin to ask, what, how do we achieve the vision you're calling us to? And that's when we began to see some of the changes and some of the things we've experienced. But you know, as you think about it as an organizational leader, there's a way that they explain it in organizational um, dynamics. Let me just see if you have that slide. There's a slide that I was explaining called the S-curve. Uh, do you have a slide of the S-curve, Emmanuel? Uh, just put it up if you have it. So usually what you have in, in organizational growth is you have what is called a sigmoid, a sigmoid curve. So a sigmoid curve shows, uh, do I have my team at the back? Are they back from lunch? Just check in there and tell us whether there are still people in there. So, so is it there? Not yet. So I draw for people with my hand. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm going to draw it for my, with my hand because my team seems to be out for lunch. So as an S curve, so you know how the letter S goes like this? All right? It goes like this. So basically, whenever you start something, whenever you start a church, whenever you start a business, whenever you start an organization, it always has a slow start. There is something that you have to put in. It's like, it's, it's, there's energy that you have to put in. There's a latent energy you have to put in. You put a lot of energy and see very little moving. And sometimes you can be discouraged. But what you don't understand is it's the same thing when you're boiling water. You put in a lot of heat and nothing happens and all of a sudden you start to see bubbles. So you put in that energy and your organization is growing like this. And then slowly the curve starts to trend upwards. And as it's trending, what's happening at that point is now the energy you're putting, you're putting in the same energy you're putting in at the beginning, but now you're moving faster. And then the curve now starts pointing upwards. For all organizations, a time comes when the energy runs out and it starts to close out. That's why it's called an S-curve. And at that point, as a leader, you begin to notice that you're putting in the same energy, but you're not getting in results. That point is when you start actually to see in your organization uh, a place where now for many people, the organization actually gets to a place where it starts to stabilize. And many mature organizations are in a place of stability. That's a mature organization, very stable. 
but also not growing fast. Um, at that point, if you're a leader, you actually can actually you can coast because you have the organization has grown. The thing you're responsible for is doing well. It's doing what it's supposed to do. It's known. It's respectable. You're no longer criticized. People no longer think you're doing something that is too exotic. But the danger at that point of the S is that if you do nothing as an organization, guess what's going to happen? Slowly, you're going to start trending downwards. If you're not growing, you're dying. That's how life is. If you're not growing, you're dying. So what happens, and this is going to help somebody here. This is going to help somebody to understand. By the way, this is also in relational dynamics. That many times you're going to find in your marriage, you're putting energy, putting energy, putting energy, and nothing's happening in the first years of your marriage. In fact, it's very easy to quit. In fact, many people quit. Because they don't understand. This is actually true for every marriage. You're going to go through a lot of challenges getting to know each other. But a time will come. Come on, somebody. This could be your word for the day. A time is coming when you're going to find that it starts moving up and you're wondering, Hiya, how is this thing moving? We are coasting. We are loving each other. We are enjoying. Ah, there it is. And guess what happens? You start to find that we are able to move. We are doing things we couldn't do. Oh, somebody, I'm giving you hope right now in your marriage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's moving. And it's like, wow, we are no longer disagreeing on everything. We are actually doing stuff. We even call each other sweetie. Come on, somebody. And we even hold each other's hands without even thinking. It's like, wow. <laughs> but guess what? A time will come when even in that marriage, you will get to a place of settling. And you get to a place where if you don't do anything, you're going to enter into a place where you just start to coast. And the reason you're coasting is because we don't have to do anything. Already we are successful. We don't have to put in anything. And you start taking for granted what it took to get you there. And if you're not careful, guess what happens? You start to fade. You start to fade. So guess what begins to, what you have to do as a, cult, as a leader, as a culture-defining leader? You have to break what is working in order for it to keep working. They have a, they have a saying, they say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's not a leader who made that quote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any good leader knows that a time comes when if it ain't broke, you have to break it for it to work again. So many of you know stories. If you've been in organizational leadership, you know the story of companies like Kodak. How many of you grew up with Kodak film? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the young ones don't even know what that is. There used to be a thing. So those days, there was a camera, just like the camera you see nowadays. But instead of it being digital, I don't even know how to explain. You had to open the back and then you remove a thing called a film. I'm not taking for granted. I know there are millennials in the house, y'all, and Gen Zs. And, and that thing, you had to take the film, and then that film, it had negatives. Oy. I'm trying to explain in English. Then you had to take the negatives and take them to be washed. <laughs> Jesus, help me. Like, how do you explain to somebody? It had to be developed. Okay, okay, like X-ray film. Have you ever seen X-ray film? It was like X-ray film. Okay, thank you, Pastor Milton. Pastor Milton has helped some young people. So that thing had to be taken through a process to become a positive. In other words, photos could come out of it. Okay, it was a big process. By the way, taking pictures was so painful those days. Because you take your photos and then you have no idea how they look until the day that they come back. 30 days later when they are finally sent back by the show. Then you're like, ah, you're even forgotten that you took pictures. Let me tell you, let me, can I give you a secret? Can I tell you how my mom knew about Pastor Carol? So I went for a camp and she bought me film. Yeah, my mom, she actually bought me film. I told her, and I, I was using my dad's nice camera. Um, I was at that age when you start borrowing your parents' things and they're very tentative about lending. But I took my dad's camera, went on this camp. She bought me film and I came back and 30 days later, she came back with a film. She was like, oh, I got you film, but I think it was the wrong film you gave me. I said, what do you mean the wrong film? She said, it's just pictures of a certain girl. I don't know who she is. <laughs> what a shock. I thought I was taking pictures of the whole camp. It would just end up... Like all, all that... They used to be like 24. Like all of them had her in them. Anyway, that's... 
So, so anyway, where was I going with this? Kodak film. So Kodak were the biggest film and photography company in the world. And they got to that place where they were so dominant. They were pretty much a monopoly. Everybody knew. In fact, when you say, instead of film, you just say, get Kodak. It, let have a Kodak moment. I mean, like everybody. That was the language everybody used. But when they got there, they just felt no, nothing can happen to us. We, we dominate the world. But technology shifted. And the shift that came was called digital film. And Kodak did not adapt fast enough because they felt they were so dominant. All their infrastructure was on analog film. And before they woke up, one day they woke up and they were bankrupt. And new companies had come up that had taken them out of business. And that's what happens if you're not at this place, at the top there, always as a leader thinking, what will help my people go to the next level? How do we move here? So I've just given you organizational language for what I explained in spiritual language. I had a sense of holy dissatisfaction. It wasn't even about growth. I just kept feeling, God, you want more for Mavuno. There's something more you want for your people. And you know what happened? God began to show me that what we needed to change was our culture. So you know, guess, guess what happens? When you break it at the top there, something happens. You reinvent your organization. You reinvent your church. You reinvent your business. You figure out what is this business? How do we achieve the vision that God is calling us to achieve? Ish, the devil doesn't want you guys to hear this stuff. It's good stuff. How do we achieve the vision God wants us to achieve or the vision that we set out to achieve in this company in the changing times around us? We can't say we've always done it this way before. The five words that killed every company that died. We've always done it the way, this way before. You can't do that. You have to ask, how do we achieve the big thing we're setting out to achieve in the new context that we're in? How do we reinvent ourselves to get there? And when you do that, at that place, instead of fading, you start a new S-curve. So it's, a, it's called a point of inflection. You start a new S-curve. And the curve begins again. And the most successful companies in the world, they always get there, and then they reinvent. And then they reinvent. And then they reinvent. That's why when you ask who Google is, for us who grew up, older days, we think of Google as a search engine. Yeah, but that's not what Google is. Google is everything. We think of Amazon as a place to buy books. That's not who Amazon is. They, they are everywhere. They're always inflecting. They're always entering into a new space because they understand that you need to keep reinventing to achieve your goal. All right, I've just given somebody organizational. Yeah, the reason your company is not growing as fast as they did in the beginning is because there's something you have to break in order to grow. No, one, one of the things that we've changed in Mavuno is our culture. God began to show me our culture will never help us achieve our vision. And so our vision, our mission remains the same. But the thing that has changed in Mavuno is how we achieve our vision and our mission. I remember this last week, one of our pastors told me, um, I think it was Pastor George. <laughs> I think it was him. I think it was Pastor George. Yes, yes, yes. He's an amazing pastor. And he told me, Pasi, as I look at what's happening at Mavuno today, I don't think there's any way we'd have ever achieved our vision the way we were set up in the past. And I told him, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. Yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, we had a great vision to, to, to plant a culture-defining church in every capital city of Africa and the gateway cities of the world by 2035. I mean, who dreams like that? That's an insane vision. And what he said is, the way we were structured before, we would never have achieved it. But in the shift that God has led us to, it will happen. How many people believe it will happen? Yeah, it's already happening. It will happen. And there's something that has shifted that has allowed us in our culture to have the, the kind of thinking that makes this possible. And I believe that this season is God's preparation for us to achieve the things that God called us to achieve right from the beginning when he set out Mavuno Church. And when we are ready, the Holy Spirit always comes. You know, it's always like they say when the, teacher, when the student is ready, the teacher comes. Whenever you're ready for the Holy Spirit to teach you something new or a new way to achieve what he's called you to do, he always shows up. One of the things I, I began to do is I became a student of global movements. And I began to learn different things from global movements. One of the things I learned most, some of them were very basic, things that you would think you know, but you actually don't. One of the things that came to, became so clear to me as I went around the world and studied global movements is that global movements pray. They really pray. I mean, 
I've, I've said this before, but Korean churches pray like crazy. Like mo- many churches open for communal prayer at 4 a.m. And it's been the way, I mean, right now it may not seem shocking at Mavuno because we pray. But those churches, like you can imagine across a whole country, their churches just open by 4. And all the way till 7, ch- people are just there with their families praying. And when they travel abroad, they do the same. So I still remember when I, was in, uh, when I was doing my master's in the U.S. that our Korean neighbors, you'd always hear the door opening and you'd hear people going with their kids. And you just know it's about five in the morning, those ones are going for prayer. And they'd go for prayer and then they wouldn't even come back home. They'd go straight to work from there. And it's like, who does that? But when, I, when you look around at global movements, they actually all pray. Uh, I, I told Pastor Godman, for some reason, because I signed up for something in his church, I'm on their mailing list. And... I'm always getting, it, it's time for our next fast. I'm like, Allah, I thought we finished, we haven't even finished the last one. Like, these guys pray. I don't even think they know it because it's so in their culture. But in the Nigerian church, there's a lot of prayer. And global churches everywhere, Southeast Asia, wherever it is, they pray crazy. You know, it's interesting because at Family Night, one of our leaders, Patsu, who's back, was telling us how in Ghana, in Ghana, they pray, like they were being asked, challenged to pray for 100 hours in a week. Like, how do you pray for 100 hours a week? Somebody's got to be crazy. What? How? But you know, it's interesting. Today, I want to talk about the power of the amen. The power of the amen. And let me just tell you, this one you don't want to miss. If you feel sleepy, stand up. Just go to the, I will not get, I will not take it personally. Just stand up, go to the side, because you don't want to miss this. Amen. <laughs> you don't want to miss the power of the amen. <laughs> Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 to 20. Matthew 18, verse 18 to 20. And here's what it says. It says, truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And he says again, truly, I tell you, If two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For, come on verse 20, where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. You know, the context of this passage, Paul uh, uh, Paul was talking about discipline in the church. This is when he's talking about that thing about if a brother sins against you, uh, go, and, go and confront him personally. Very powerful, by the way. Matthew 18, if you ever have issues with somebody in the church, in your discipleship group, this is how you learn how to do it. You go and confront them personally and ask them and say, look, look, when you say that, it hurt me. Many of us were not taught that, by the way, when we were young Christians or when we were growing up in our homes. Many of our homes, when somebody hurts you, you assume the worst. You're taught to assume they are trying to kill you. Some of you have such bad imaginations. Whenever somebody says something, you assume they're they're trying to destroy you. And it's not funny, it's true. (laughs) And I know some of you, by the way. (laughs) Like even the pastor looks, in fact, sometimes I don't even look certain parts of the church when I'm talking. Because you'll take it personally. I look at your side, you won't take it personally, amen. And, 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 And you get easily hurt and you don't know what to do. This person, they must have been looking at me, they must have been... And the Bible says in Matthew 18, the first thing you do when somebody hurts you, throw them a rope. When, 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 when somebody hurts me, I always think you've dug yourself a hole. So what I do is I throw you a rope. I come to you and I throw you a rope. What does throwing you a rope mean? It means I assume the best. I assume, you know what? I don't believe she meant that. She must have been unhappy. She must have been emotional. She must have been thinking about something else. She must have had issues. There must be something that bothered her for her to say such an unkind thing. So I give you a rope by coming and saying, Pastor Mills, when you say this, man, I was really hurt. That's a rope. When I throw you a rope in that hole, you know what you can do with a rope? You can do two things. You can pull yourself out or you can hang yourself. What's pulling yourself out? Pulling yourself out is what happens 98% of the time. Somebody says, ah, really? You are hurt. I wasn't even thinking about you. I'm so sorry that you, you felt hurt because that's not what I was thinking. And here, I, I've been carrying this thing for a whole day or two days or even a week feeling that you must be so angry and then I realize you are not even thinking about me. That's so humbling, isn't it? Like, oh, okay, sour. <laughs> that's fine. You just pulled yourself out. 
Or you could hang yourself where you say, aha, in fact, you heard me, you didn't even hear me properly. This is what I meant to say, you are a fool. You know, at that point, you've just hung yourself because you've shown me who you really are. It's not my imagination. Am I talking to somebody? So that's Matthew. He says, take some, just come and confront them yourself. And he says, if they don't listen to you, Matthew says, don't give up. Get another believer, come and confront them together. If they still don't listen, bring the church with you. So bring your DG leader, bring your pastor with you and confront them. And at that point, if they are still hanging themselves, the Bible says, treat them like an unbeliever. Treat them like an unbeliever. That's what Matthew 18 says. So in the context of that, that's what the context of this passage is. Because it's talking about the power of agreement. The power of agreement. But then he continues to say some things that are really powerful, that are very applicable to prayer. And Jesus points out the power of coming together to agree in the name of Jesus. When our schedule leaves out the power of communal prayer, there's a lot of untapped power that we don't experience in our lives. There's something powerful where two or three gather and agree. And I want to share just a couple of things that happen when you pray together. You know, some of you don't know this, and your major prayer warriors, you pray even 40-day fasts. In fact, some of you do 50 days. I've always said 50 days, I don't see it in the Bible. Me, I only do what's in the Bible, <laughs> you know. But some of you have done it, and it's a powerful thing. But the Bible says there's something powerful when two or three gather, when there's a community that agrees to gather together and say an amen. Praying together results in greater power. That's number one. It results in greater power. There's a greater power when spirit-filled believers unite and pray in one accord to God. There's just a power that is released. One person praying alone is heard. Is heard. Prayer of a righteous person. You're heard. But when we pray with more than just one person, it amplifies the power of prayer. There's an amplification that God has built into prayer. In Acts chapter 1 verse 14, it says the, brother, the, the brethren joined together. It says they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the, Mary, with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. There was a constancy, there was a togetherness. Nobody was praying by themselves. They were one in one accord, it says in King James. These believers, they prayed constantly for 10 days. And what happened next, it changed the world as we know it. These timid people who had run away from Jesus, the minute they prayed like this, God answered, the room was shaken, uh, something new came, uh, the Holy Spirit came down in power like had never come before, there was a loud earthquake, there was a noise, and then one of them, the one who had denied Jesus the most, stood up and preached. 3,000 people got saved. Like you guys, 3,000 people got saved. First church someone ever preached by a guy who had just denied Jesus a few weeks earlier. That's what happens when brothers and sisters agree in prayer. Ten days of prayer and the world changed. You know, there was a, 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 in, the early, in the third century, there was, this mona, there was a monastic movement. And people felt the world had become such a horrible place. And it had because the Roman Empire had collapsed. Peace, peace and order had gone. And the world had become a dark place. And by the way, I actually think that we often, when you understand, if you don't understand history, then you don't understand it can repeat itself. Right now we live in what is called the, we, at that time they had the, what they call the Pax Romana. Because Rome controlled the world and the world was a peaceful place. We've lived and experienced what, is, what I call the Pax Americana. We've lived in a world where peace is guaranteed and stable. And you can fly to other countries and we assume that's the way life is. But I believe right now there are forces at work that could actually cause our children to grow up in a completely different world where you can't just travel where you want to go. And nationalistic forces are fighting everywhere. But you know, when that happened in Rome, the, the world entered the Dark Ages. I'm teaching a lot of history right now. And the, when the world entered the Dark Ages, the church had to survive. And one of the ways people decided to survive is by detaching from the evil empire. And Christians formed their own little communities and some of them actually decided they will go out by themselves and become hermits. I don't want to be contaminated by other people. I can see people have issues. I'm just going to go to the wilderness and seek God by myself. And there's a whole group of people uh, in that season who wrote a lot of things. God used them. They're called the Desert Fathers. And they're writings from the Desert Fathers in the, third, in the third century. But there's one Desert Father who shared a vision. And he talked about a vision he heard where, when, when he was in prayer. And God showed him the power of his prayer. 
And he said, in the time, because you know, you're, you're there and you've been praying. This guy had been fasting and praying in the desert for some time. He was a prayer warrior, like serious prayer warrior. And as he was praying, God opened his spiritual eyes and he began to see his prayers. He saw these darts of fire. Shua, 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 shua. Like just these darts going up into the heavens. And the guy was like, wow, this is what my prayer looks like. It's like powerful. It's like these darts. And then God told him, turn your eyes. And when he turned, he saw the church down the road, a church that was a bit far, that he had not really thought highly of. And there was a group of saints that were praying together in the church. And instead of that, he saw this stream of fire. <sighs> like this huge thing that was just going up. It looked like a Marvel movie. You know those things of... <sharp inhale> okay, he didn't write that. That's me adding to the story. But it's like he just saw this thing that was going up, shooting into the heavens. And he realized what God was telling him. It doesn't matter how long you pray. Your prayer will never be as powerful as when my people come together in one accord. There's something that happens when we pray together. Something that happens when we pray together. I call it the power of the amen. I had, um, I, I've shared this story before. Some of you may have heard it. I remember when uh, Reverend Adeboye uh, came to Kenya the first time that I, had it, I saw him here. And this man of God, he is the leader of the RCCG uh, probably fast, one of the fastest growing churches, if not the fastest growing church movement in, in the world. They have like 50,000, 60,000 churches uh, that the man has seen grow in his lifetime. Uh, I mean, they're just insane. They're at a different level. I mean, we've, Pastor Godman was the one who took me there for the first time. Pastor Godman took us to see Winner's Chapel, and it was crazy. I mean, we'd never seen anything like that. It was like, ah, oh, wow. If you ever go, those of you who go to Winner's Chapel, you know what I'm talking about. You go to Canaan Land, their headquarters, you're like, ah, oh, like you've never seen anything like that. Then they take you to RCCG. Redemption camp of RCCG, it's not of wow, it's of laughter. You just laugh. It's ridiculous. Like people don't think like that in real life. Like how, who thinks like this? Like it was so ridiculous the things we saw in that place. Like I, even in my wildest dreams, I'd never thought someone can have faith like that. So this man comes into Nairobi and he comes in the middle of our post-election violence and the whole country is in fear, in like people are not talking to each other. Good friends are, are now in opposite sides of this political camp. I think it's the first time that Kenya really looked at this demon of tribalism uh, face, face on. And, 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 and that time that his church had invited him. So he came in the middle of the chaos. And I remember that he uh, stood up at Solution Center, the RCCG that was the, the headquarters then here. And you know how he speaks. He doesn't animate his voice. He's so children. God is saying, like seriously, like you look at him and you're like, this is a guy who leads, because his pastors are fiery. If you know some of those, are, they are serious. They preach a house down. I mean, the guy just talks with such a quiet tone. He said, children, don't worry. Nothing will happen to you. When I enter a town, all demonic activity has to cease. Even the Freemason can't meet while I'm here. And he continued talking. You know, I wasn't there that day. I was listening to the tape. I had to rewind. What did the guy just say? Because you could have missed it. He just said it so quietly. And he says, he says, ah, you're worried about this fight between Kibaki and Raila. He says, don't worry. By the end of the week, before I leave this conference, Raila will be here himself. And he will actually be telling you your country will be well. So let's focus on God's word. That's how he talks. And then he continued. You're like, did I just hear what the guy said? Like who, like, because his voice and the tone is not matching the power of what he has just said. Guys, before the end of that week, Honorable Railau himself was in that church, greeting believers and telling them, we have agreed with Kibaki, this country is not burning. The country is more important than any of us. You're like, What? But that's the authority. Like, imagine being at a place where you enter a town and demonic activity ceases. Do you believe that's true? There are people who have that authority. When you ask about him, I don't believe it's because he's an incredible guy. But you know what? Reverend Adeboy has a million people at the very least who whenever he prays, say amen. There's a power of an amen that makes that man, he's He's untouchable in the spiritual realm. Yeah. 
He is because of the power of the amen. And I want to just say, guys, that this is how God intended for you to be. That you will walk into a place and the demons will say, Pass this, we know. Pastor Victor, we know. Pastor Kilonzi, we know. Yeah. Why is that? Because there's a power of an amen behind you. You know, we often see the Apostle Paul. We forget that the Apostle Paul was even launched into prayer, into his ministry by a prayer meeting. Yeah. That's why the devil says, Paul, we know. But who are you? <laughs> These guys just decided, ah, even us, we can say the same words. In the name of Jesus. You even say it loudly so that the demon can hear you. Demons are not deaf, by the way. You don't need to shout. You just speak with authority. Yeah? You don't need to. I mean, I think sometimes prophetic um, training can mislead people. And you think it's, if I contort myself and I really show, then demons will be afraid. <laughs> I think sometimes demons laugh at us. So it's not about that. There is power when we pray together. There is power when we pray together. You know, it's interesting, the, the, the prince of preachers, his name was called Charles Spurgeon. He's one of the most famous uh, preachers who preached, had a church in, back in the day before mega churches, way, way before anybody even knew what that word meant, had a church of 10,000 in England. And that man preached, and my goodness, like demons would come out of people while he was preaching. He would just preach, he wouldn't even cast them out, just preaching word by word, his text. And people would just be being filled with the spirit. But you know what? Charles Spurgeon... What many people didn't know is below the pulpit, there was actually a, a prayer room. And there, were, there was a team of people who had covenanted that when this man is praying, is preaching, we will be praying all the time. And no wonder this man could impact his whole nation and the world beyond because of the power of the amen. Who says amen when you pray? Who says amen when you pray? Who agrees with your prayer? If you increase the level of praying together in your, in your congregation, in your discipleship group, you will see more miracles happen. I guarantee that. You will see more miracles happen. Praying together, number two, prepares us for miracle signs and wonders. It prepares us for miracle signs and wonders. Acts chapter 4 verse 31. It says, when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak the word of God with boldness. They began to speak the word of God with boldness. They began to preach. They began to see things they had not seen before. The place was actually shaken. When they were praying, God answered right there. He didn't even wait for afterwards. Like they left there with a, having experienced an earthquake that was caused by their prayer. You know, it's very interesting because I quoted this verse, James 5.16, the, the, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And some people will say, but Pasi, when you talk to us about praying with others, don't you understand it's true? The prayer of a righteous man can also be powerful and effective. I want to give you the context of that scripture. Because if you read ahead in James chapter 5, verse 14, let's go to James 5.14 before 16. That's a verse we know. But it says, is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And then in verse 15 it says, And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Right? So this person called people, leaders around them in church, their DC, DG members, uh, leaders of the church to pray, and they were prayed for. And then verse 16, it says, and not only were they healed, they were also forgiven. What? Like when, when, when your leaders pray for you in that way, the Bible says you're not only healed, you're also forgiven. And then it says, and the prayer offered in faith. Then it says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Yeah. So, so whenever we quote that verse, you forget what came before it. This man called his leaders, says, I have an issue. I need to be laid on hands. These people poured oil on him and he was laid on hands. And then he had a revelation in that laying on of hands that there are sins in my life that need to be confessed. And so he went and confessed his sins to somebody. And then he prayed and the prayer of a righteous man was powerful and effective. Uh -uh, that prayer did not come out of anywhere. It came out of an amen somewhere. Yeah. There was a community process that led to that prayer of a righteous man being powerful and effective. There's something that begins to happen when we pray together. Miracles begin to happen. 
the devil begins to flee. Impossible becomes possible. Things we never imagined begin to happen. I want to call uh, Pastor Irene. Is she here? Come, 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 come. I like putting her on the spot. Come, 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 come. I'm just, I hadn't planned this in the, meet, in the sermon, but I'll just include her here. Come, come, come. She's, she's one of those ones who, by God's grace, Pastor Caro and I gave her a little push <laughs> into the crocodile pool. So Pastor Irene, and you guys know the story. Pastor Irene and I met in, uh, not met, but um, this, this year in March, we visited Diani and then she had, we are coming and her DG, uh, actually her, it used to be a life group called Kizazi. Come on, those people are in the house. Kifalme, Kifalme, Kifalme. Sorry, I'm, I'm baptizing you. There's somebody else called Kizazi. So the Kifalme people are here. And when they had, I was going there, they said, Irene has to host you. We're actually going to host you as, as a group. So they actually got her to host us. So we went and stayed in her house. And in the process, we had dinner with her. And she told us, oh, I miss my church. And we say to, to, to her, uh, she said, please, please bring a pastor. To bring a, we need Mavuno Indiani. And I told her permission granted. And so she, she started a church in her house, which is now Mavuno Diani. And some of, the, some of your army is around. Are they here? Aha, uh -huh, they're here. So you are telling me a story today about how uh, there's... You, you called your people together to covenant in prayer. And you, there's a video at Central. Some of you watched that video of the guys who covenanted in prayer. And so she watched that video and decided to form a covenant in prayer. How did the covenant work? What did you guys agree to do? No, actually we had formed the prayer before, but we were not as serious as Aha, we were nice. until we saw the video. So after we saw the video is when we decided, okay, we are going to be more serious and I gave them uh, instructions. One of the instructions is to go off social media and to, to stay away from news and all those things and stay away from offense. And, and some of them at my witness, they used to get offended by small things. So I told them, if you, if you want to be in my prayer warrior group, you have to stay away from offense. You, you have to be on time for the prayers and um, what was the other group? Oh, the fast, we were doing the fast the, the six, Daniel fast, in, when you break, your, you break your fast at 6 p.m. and you only do vegetables and fruits. Okay. And you decided to do it for three days, I think. We decided to do it only for three days. But, but there was a, a caveat there. Those are yes. So, <laughs> so every day we did it because somebody was either late, Amma, they posted on Instagram, and they, not on Instagram, on WhatsApp story, and I saw it. <laughs> we were like, no, you've broken the covenant. We have to start again. So we kept starting and starting and starting, and by the time we are done, it's two weeks. So we never finished, like we were not, we were fasting. Like so your commitment was, if anyone breaks this commitment. If you break your covenant, if you join in late, because we were joining in, first we were joining it at 5.30 a.m. after the 4.30 a.m. prayers. Then because I, after I saw the video, I moved it to 3 a.m. So you guys were waking up at 3 a.m.? No, you wake up at 2.30. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> so you show up for prayer by 3? You show up at prayer by 2.50 2 a.m. 2.50, okay. We play music for 10 minutes, and then we start prayers at 3 a.m. And then you pray all the way to 4.30? All the way to 4, you take a break, we join the 4.30 a.m. prayers, we finish, we go into the Mavuno DNA prayers at 5.30 to 6.30. So it's a six, it's a three-hour prayer. Wow. And you did this for two weeks? For two weeks. Remember, we are hungry, we've not eaten, we've not slept. And we just kept going and there were new rules every time. And my team just kept going and going and they never asked questions. They never, uh, they never wanted. In fact, they were begging me every time they were making a mistake. They're like, I, I'm conf I confessed I, I did this. Can we start again? <laughs> can, we, can we extend? And remember that time, I'm like, I'm also hungry. I miss my cake. We kept postponing and postponing and postponing. Yeah. But now the miracle started happening is that when we realized, wow, this thing is actually real. When we invited, we said, okay, this, this prayer, prayer uh, ministry needs to, go, to be larger than it is because we were seven. So I told them, look for three, five other ladies. Invite them and then you will lead that prayer exactly the way I've led it. Oh, wow. With the exact same uh, um, uh, rules. 
and with the same exact strictness. Because when we started, we were 10, and I kept taking people out because they were breaking the rules, breaking the rules. Wow. Yeah. So you got each of the, the people in your group to each lead their own group? Each lead So when were people. they praying? Sorry? When would they pray? Or would the they all come time. into the same prayers? No, no, no. They will lead their own people at the same time. Wow. And before that, I, I called all of them for an introduction of the first. So when the first day, because they all brought their ladies and we were 35 women who showed up for the introduction of the first. And they kept asking me, me questions. Um, I have a live, uh, my, my, my work is online. She, actually, she's watching. She's from America, Beatrice Itau. She told me that, she's like, I, I work online. What do I do during this fast? I said, cancel. She's like, but it's cancel. Wow. If you want to join, you have to cancel everything. Come on. And just concentrate Ultimate reality. On yes. So, so as you're pushing through, people are making mistakes, but it's like, it's okay. Let's start again. Let's start again. We're going to do this and think, until we finish. Yes. Yes. You began to see the miracles. We started seeing so the miracles. So tell us some of the things that began to happen that you could never have explained. So what, what, the, the first thing that happened, I got a call. Uh, Leah, one of the ladies, prayer warrior, had invited a guy. So now it, it was a, a women ministry, prayer ministry, but I had to extend to the, to the men as well because she, she wanted her dad to join, her other friends, and also I had Mavuno Diani men that I wanted to join. So they joined the, that. Uh, we formed a different group for the men where they started joining. Day two of the men joining, the guy calls Leah and said, Leah, I have a testimony, but if I told you this, you would not even believe. My dad had been diagnosed by blood cancer for the last uh, six months. It was for stage four. He was almost dying. And day two, he had a wound. I think I showed you the wound. He had a wound. It was a, the leg. His whole leg was just red. His whole red. leg was like it was being eaten. I, I would have shared the picture, but it, it's, it's just some, some, it's, it's very too gory. It's gory to see. Yeah. And day two of the fast, uh, prayer and fasting, the dad was healed. The, the leg was completely, completely healed. healed. There was no wound. And he, there was no pain. He was able to walk. He's not, he's not been able to walk for seven days. And I was like, what? Wow. You mean there are miracles happening? So I decided, okay, let's call all the ladies and all the people from your small, small, where you meet. Let's now have one prayer. Then we did one prayer. And now that's when miracles happen. So one lady, she's in uh, Hill City. I'm not going to share her name. She has a daughter who's, who's uh, nonverbal for four years. Couldn't speak. Could not speak. Didn't say a word. Her neighbors called her saying, your daughter has said her name. Wow. What, wow. what did you wow. do? Wow. Your wow. daughter has said her name. Wow. 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 My, uh, there's another lady who had been asking God for a job. She was not able to get anything. She got a job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A pinnacle job, something that she never thought she'd get. Wow, wow. I know and that's not the only cancer that was healed. That was Another not the cancer. only cancer. Another cancer, uh, one of the guys shared on the chat and said, my, my, uh, he said that his, da his, his grandpa had been sick for so long. He had cancer, prostate cancer. Then he developed pneumonia that was not going away for three months. The three of the first everything ended. And one thing I realized is that the covenant we made, we were all in agreement. No taking offense. If you have, if somebody offends you, if you're, and you know my sister, my younger sister was also in the first. There's a day she called me like, you know my boss, I was like, I don't want to hear it. I don't. <laughs> Please don't tell me. I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm very focused. I don't want to be offended and I don't want to also take other, I don't want to inherit offense. Like now I want to inherit your offense. Your boss did. I <laughs> you don't have know your own what. issues. Keep them. Please. Yeah. Wow. So that's what we did. You know, uh, okay. Thank you. We're gonna we're gonna hear this story. I, I think she. I just met her today morning, and she came for prayer. And I was just asking her what's happening, and she told me that. I said, Oh my goodness, that's exactly what God told me to teach about. The power of the Amen. Our newest baby church, one of our newest baby churches. They can't say they have a long track record of praying. Irene has never been a pastor before, but the power of the Amen means that impossible cancers are being healed. Things that doctors said would never be healed are being healed. When you pray together, miracles, signs, and wonders will happen. In agreement. In agreement. You know, it's interesting because I think we grew up in churches where prayer was, a prayer meeting was just a place. But a prayer meeting is not a place of playing. And I don't know if you heard what Irene said. She said there were some very strict things that we did in that group. 
we kicked you out if you are not ready. You know, some people got offended because we said in Mavuno, we're going to kick you out if your video is not on. And it's because you actually don't realize the place we are calling you into. You think it's a place for just to be nice Christians and to hope God answers. No, this is a war room. It's a war room. Yes, there, we have family. By the way, we have worship nights. Bring your non-Christian friends to worship night if that's what they're ready for. That's okay. It's a beautiful place. And God actually moves in worship night. In fact, as we pray at 4.30, they will be healed at worship night. And then they'll be ready to come in at 4.30 and turn on their videos. Because there's something that we're trying to do here that is helping people begin to understand the power of the amen. Praying in one accord. People who understand one thing. Number three, praying together results in greater faith. It grows your faith like nothing else. When you pray together, you will see rapid growth of the church. You will see rapid growth of the faith of the people in the church. You will see spiritual fitness in your church. It's interesting because this is how it works. Maybe I'm going through a tough time. And in the middle of it, I'm trying to pray with trust and I'm trying to pray with faith. But you know, all I'm seeing is a demon. All I'm seeing is the issue. I'm seeing how my marriage is hard. And I'm seeing how... Am I talking to people here? There are times you're praying and you just can't see this thing move. It's beset you until it's become a thing on your head. And you just feel even as you're praying, you're just praying. But you don't even have faith. This thing will be answered. And as I'm in that place, I come into my prayer meeting. And I'm listening to other people praying. And as I'm listening to them, I begin to un understand their faith. I begin to hear them pray in ways I have never prayed. I begin to hear them address God in ways I've never thought of addressing God. I hear them say things and I'm like, wow, I never thought that. Today, Pastor James told us that he told us some things and I was like, wow. Like, oh my goodness. He told us, even if you praise God for the rest of your life, it will never be enough. You, there's no risk where you will ever under praise God. And I remember my worship just moved to another level. This is what happens when you're praying together. You're listening to each other praying. And you know in our prayer meetings at 4.30, there are some two voices that you just hear rising up. Eh? Do you know those guys in your network who is like, I know this woman's voice. And there's just a way she prays. You're like, even at some point you find yourself just, as you are praying something, you hear her praying something else, you just flow without prayer. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're learning. You're being taught. And guess what's happening? As you're swinging into that prayer, your faith is growing. You're matching faith for faith. And you find yourself moving into places you never could have moved into. That's how we grow in our faith when we pray together. It's a beautiful thing. It's like prayer is like driving. You can go and do all the theory you want. But the only way you'll ever learn to drive a car is by driving a car. It's the same thing with praying together. The only way you'll ever learn how to do it is when we get in and we do it. And as we begin to do it, you begin to understand there's a sweetness to it. There's a power to it. There's a flowing to it. Oh my goodness, I, I love praying together. I love praying together in one accord. Listen, those who are new in faith, they listen to others and their faith just accelerates. There's some people, by the way, who joined Mavuno in the last year or two, whose faith has accelerated beyond some people who've been saved for 20 years. Because of just being in that place where their faith is being accelerated by others as they're listening to them pray and worship and praise God. Yeah. Number four, praying together strengthens unity. There's nothing that strengthens the unity of the church like when you pray together. You know, let me just tell you, the devil loves to divide and rule. The one way the devil will keep you ineffective in your prayers is through disunity. You heard what Pastor Irene was saying, don't bring offense. Because he knows once there's offense, then I can't, I can't pray with Pastor Dorcas anymore because I'm suspicious of her. I don't think I like how she speaks. I don't think I like how she, I, I mean, what, like how? And, and because I'm offended, now when she prays, I can't say amen anymore. Or my amen is not sincere. And I think I'm punishing her. What I don't realize is I'm robbing the whole church of power. That's how the devil comes in. If you watch that video, that's exactly what he does, isn't it? If he finds a powerful church, if the devil finds a powerful praying church, he can never attack it head on. Because he knows your power. You're above him. So the best thing he can do is look around. That's what lions do when they find a herd of buffalo. They understand if I go straight here, I die. So what they do, they look around and they're just looking for that weak one, that isolated one, that offended one, the one that has decided to be independent, the one that has decided me, I watch Mavuno from, from, from home because I, 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 I just don't like how Mavunites nowadays are. And, 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 and I've never gone to my church anymore because I got so ang angry at them. And it's like, it's like I, I, I can't stand those people, but I still love Jesus. I'm going to watch him at home. You're that buffalo that has just been spotted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lion that has seen you. 
and he loves to isolate you. So guess what praying together does? It builds our unity. Builds our unity. By the way, I love when I see some of you, I knew you from prayer. I know, I know Riga from prayer, by the way. Some of you think I know, I know Riga from singing, but for me, when I come for downtown prayers, I love how he prays, by the way. Yeah, and, and even older Christians learn from younger Christians, by the way. There are things I've seen some of the younger Christians do that I'm like, ah, I need to do that. How come I no longer pray with as much zeal as I see this young guy praying? Ah, Mr. B, I like how you pray. Yeah, I've heard you pray. I've heard you pray. I love it. I love it. This is what happens. Our unity starts to become one. And guess what happens? When we start to pray one, we begin as one, we begin to realize our powers, our, our prayers are powerful and effective. We are, we, are in, we are undefeatable as long as we are united. Genesis 11.6, if as one people, doing the same thing, speaking the same language, they have begun to do this thing. Nothing will be impossible for them. God himself in heaven says those words. As in God sees these people building an, an idol, an evil thing. And God himself, he says to his angels, he says, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they have a conversation. They're like, if as one people, speaking the same language, they start to do this thing. It's like God is alarmed. He's like, ah, I created these guys with too much power. They might use this power against me. And God says, let's go down and confuse their language. So they will not be able to do this. Uh, but if you use that verse and look at it from the positive side, if as one people, speaking the same language, if we choose to do the God thing, there's nothing that will be impossible for us. Nothing that will be impossible for us. Let me tell you, when there is unity in the downtown network, they are unstoppable. They will be unstoppable. There is no church in the downtown network that the enemy can attach, can attach himself to, so long as there is unity. There's unity. This, this network will be unstoppable. South Network, you will be unstoppable. So, completely unstoppable. Ah, the minute you agree and you become one, and you start contending as one man for the gospel, as Paul says, uh uh, nothing will be impossible. You'll be praying simple prayers and cancer is healed. Yeah. By the way, these guys, they didn't pray at his serious prayers over in the name of Jesus. They didn't shout, they just agreed. I love how Jesus, he just said, come out. In fact, he said it so quietly, they wouldn't, like guys are like, because the demons are already fleeing, they're entering pigs. As he's just walking into town, he has, no, he has no need to demonstrate. He doesn't need to shout or to contort himself because of the authority. We have spiritual authority when we come together as a community. That's why Jesus taught us to pray, our, uh, 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 uh. come on somebody, come on somebody, come on somebody. There's a revelation dropping in the house right now. How long have we prayed that prayer as if it's my prayer? Uh-uh. And sometimes some of us, we pray, our Father, he says, you and who? Because I've never seen you praying with anybody. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're wondering why you're powerless in your prayers. It's our Father. Yeah. When we're united, he taught them to pray. They said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. The first thing he said is, our Father. When there's that unity, oh my goodness, there's nothing that is impossible for you. Nothing that is impossible for you. That's why Romans 15 verse 5 to 6, uh, Paul says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he prays for his people. I want you to have one mind. I want to come to Mashariki and find people with one mind. Yeah. One mind. Unstoppable. Loving each other. Your burden is my burden. Your pain is my pain. The Bible says, mourn with those who mourn. Your celebration is my celebration. Uh -uh. When we start agreeing together, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Yeah, this is what's happening. Let me just tell you, this thing, uh, I, I, I looked at it and I said, God, give us the grace to understand it. Give us the grace to understand it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting because many people, this is how we do it. It's like I no longer feel my church. I no longer feel the chills I used to feel in the early days. Downtown these days is not like how it used to be when Pastor Kev, the, other, the, the real Pastor Kev was there. Uh-huh. Yeah, somehow it doesn't feel, I don't feel the same chills. I don't feel the same energy. 
And, and, and for many people, by the way, that's their cue. Let me just say this. Many Christians are under deception. Because many people come and tell you, I sense God is asking me to leave. And when you interrogate, what do you mean by that sense? I no longer enjoy it the way I enjoyed it. So you have made your enjoyment to be the filter of who God is. Are you worshipping God or are you worshipping yourself? Whose voice are you listening to here? So, yeah, how? how? How is it that I no longer enjoy it so God can't be in it? By the way, this, I hope you're hearing me here. Because note me, many Christians in Nairobi, this is how they operate. I no longer enjoy it means God is not in it. And we've made our enjoyment the filter for God is working. Oh, come on, God is not captive to your enjoyment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not about you. God is perfect without you. Whether you enjoy him or not, he's still God. Yeah. And many times God actually withdraws enjoyment. Do you know that? There are times God withdraws enjoyment because he doesn't want you to worship enjoyment. He wants you to worship him. And it's an inevitable thing. It's an inevitable thing in your faith. You will notice it. That there are times when things were easy, you flowed, and all of a sudden now it's like you're praying and you're not seeing the breakthrough, and you're struggling and you're wondering, what happened? Did God leave me? No, God didn't leave you. He removed the consolation. He, re he removed the emotion. Because he wants you to walk not by sight, but by faith. Yeah. And, and, and we're, we're so caught up on, 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 on feelings. And, and, and action and things happening. And when they're not happening, we feel like God has abandoned us. No, God hasn't abandoned you. God just wants you to love you for him. Yeah. Are you still going to love me when you no longer enjoy the feelings? By the way, this happens in marriage as well. Huh? God removes the consolation of feelings in marriage. I'm talking to somebody in the house. And the big thing is, I no longer feel the way I used to feel when we were together. And many people come and say, Pastor, our marriage is over. We're out of love. What do you mean you're out of love? I no longer feel how I used to feel when I was with this person. And you know what I tell people? I tell them, now you're maturing in your marriage. Because marriage is not about feelings. <laughs> marriage is a covenant. Yeah. In fact, God removes the feelings so that you can love the person, feeling or no feeling. Yeah, I wish my sweetie was here. I tell you stories about her. Yeah, she's coming. She's coming. Yeah. But I can tell you many times in our marriage, that's been a test where God says, I need you to love this woman whether you feel love right now or not. Because love is an action and a commitment. Feelings follow the commitment. If people could operate, I mean, because if people could operate in marriage, the way, the way we leave churches is the way we leave marriage nowadays. It's like I'm no longer feeling you. And, and you're going to look for which one who will give you feelings? <laughs> a dentist will give you feelings. <laughs> Only a dentist can give you real feelings, by the way, consistently. <laughs> Jesus, save this church. Guys, I'm saving a marriage in the house right now. When you no longer feel for that partner of yours, that is a place of maturity where God wants you to move beyond feelings and start loving them in actions by faith. Treat her like you treat her. Just imagine you're wildly in love with her and start treating her that way like you would treat her if you're wildly in love with her and watch what God does. That's a word for somebody. By the way, you came, to this, you came here to hear that word. Yeah. Just just imagine. Just imagine in your mind. Remember remind how you remember how you are in love. And the crazy things you used to do for her. And just start doing them. Not not from feelings. Just start doing them. Watch God bless your marriage and even the feelings start following you. Yeah. By the way, it's the same thing about your church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just imagine those early days when you loved your church. And you were there every day early. And you served in ministry. And you loved God's people. Yeah, before they disappointed you and you realized they're human like you. Yeah. And then, start to act towards your church the same way. Just start to love them. Start to serve them. 
Watch the feelings start to come. Start to invest in that church and give. Watch the feelings start to come, by the way. Watch the feelings. By the way, this thing, it's a guaranteed thing. Feelings cannot lead your life. Feelings follow. They don't lead you. They don't lead you. And this is the beautiful thing about, about praying together. When we begin to understand that it's not, when I don't feel for my wife, pray for her. When you don't feel for your church, pray for your church. Pray for church members. Watch God. When you don't like your pastor anymore, pray for them. That's why the Bible says, I urge you that prayers and intercessions be made for leaders. Because as you pray for your leader, you begin to understand the role that they carry. God begins to give you a sympathy for them. And the Bible says, it goes well with you. It goes well with you. So praying together builds unity. By the way, I love... Hey, some of the churches here, are you, there's unity in those churches. Mm -mm. Mavuno Lovington, yes. Yes. They love each other. There's a strong unity when I, whenever I, and by the way, let me tell you this. When you, when you go to a church where people love each other, you enjoy being there. Love, love, <laughs> Ington. <laughs> I love, I love Lovington because of that. Like when I'm there, I feel the love they have for each other. And you know, a godly love is not an exclusive love. It's not an arrogant love. It's an inclusive love. And whenever I'm in Lovington, I feel part of the love of that church. Yeah. It's true. I, I love that. And by the way, I'm, don't, don't feel jealous, by the way. I love your church as well. Yeah. I'm just using them because they're loud and they're here. And they, they have to be heard. <laughs> they have to be heard. <laughs> so pray. Pray together. You will see unity in your church. By the way, you'll start to enjoy church. Where you didn't enjoy, you start enjoying being in church. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, the devil loves isolated Christians. He knows how defense, defenseless you are when you're isolated. Number five, praying together moves us from selfish to God-centered prayers. It moves us from selfish to God-centered prayers. Something beautiful happens when we start to pray together. You know, the most important reason for prayer is not to seek blessing. Did you know that? It's not to seek blessing. It's to seek God. It's to seek the blesser. The reason for prayer is to enter into God's heart, to be close to Him. Prayer is a love song. It's us connecting with our Maker, the one who loves us. By the way, prayer always starts. When you're a child, it starts with give me, give me, give me. That's how, even children, that's how they are. Give me. They want milk. They want, <laughs> you know, it's like once you put the breast in their mouth, they stop crying. They're so happy. Then they burp. <laughs> By the way, that's how baby Christians are. Give me, give me, I just want, I just want, I'm here for prayer. Then they get it, they bop. <laughs> and they go, and they're happy. <laughs> and then they don't show up until they need more milk. Next time you see them in prayer meeting is when? There's more need. And that's a, that's a good thing, by the way. I'm not making fun of baby Christians, because all of us were there. But with time, prayer stops being about what God gives me, and it becomes about me wanting to give God. Me wanting to be in God's presence. Me just enjoying my father. That's what prayer is about. Yeah, that's what it's about. And guess what? As you pray with others, you start to hear their prayers. You start to hear that they're not just praying about God, give me, God, give me. They're praying your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They're praying that this house is an altar of the most high God. They're praying over the, 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 the demons that are oppressing families. And you start to listen to them and you're like, wow, this is different. This is not how I pray. You know, back in the day, I mean, you remember even some of, your, some of you really despise those prayers of your parents. Where when they're praying for food, they start praying for the hands that made it, the cow that was milked, the farmer who produced. And <laughs> you're dying at that point. You're like, God, help this farmer, but I need to eat. <laughs> so, so I always say there's a difference between public prayer and community prayer. When we're all praying together, we can pray for long. When you're praying for food, please just pray for the food and finish. I, I, I'm not condoning one-hour prayers for food here. May that never become our culture in Mavuno Church. But, but you know what? Prayer that is driven by our little selfish interests is childish prayer. And you get to a place, as we were reminded earlier uh, by Pastor God, well, you get to a place where you start to pray and there's revelation. And, and Peter prays and, 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 and the, the doors open and he walks out and Paul prays and the door opens and he stays in. 
Because God, he realizes, the doors opening are not for me, they're for the jailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like being free is good, but there's a guy who needs to be saved. So because of that, I will stay in the cell for the sake of that man and his family. That's now, you, you, your mind has moved from little selfish baby prayers. It's become about God's will be done in my life as it is in heaven. I hate this job. Lord, I want to move. But Lord, if you open, as you show me what you want me to do, I will stay here as long as it takes to finish your will before I leave this place. I'm not going to be those Christians where I'm like, I don't feel it anymore. I'm gone. No, no, no. I understand God's will. God wants me here for a reason, for a purpose, and I will stay. Many people's prayers seek the best fix for the situation. We typically pray for what we need as opposed to asking, what does God want? Yeah, Lord, Lord, what do you want? I learned that prayer from my wife, by the way. Again, praying with others. She prays, Pastor Carol, she's always like, before we pray, let's ask God to show us how we should pray. I'm like, ah, what do you mean how to pray? That guy annoyed us. We need to be praying. God kills him. No, 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 no. Let's ask God to show us how to pray. And that just taught me, ah, uh -uh. the first prayer I need to be asking is, God, what's your will in this situation? And that's how Jesus is able to pray and say, God, I know what my desire is. I, I don't want to eat to face this cup. But nevertheless, let your will be done, not my will. Yeah. That's what God wants, us to move from baby prayers to God-seeking prayers. Bible says, Matthew 6, verse 33, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. All these things will be given to you as well. I think I, if I got a shilling for every time I've mentioned that verse this year, I'd be a very rich man. That's, 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 that's the truth of God's word. It's like he wants us to seek his kingdom with no concern because he understands as we seek what he wants, what we want will happen automatically. Yeah. He wants us to move from being babies to being at the place where we are kingdom seekers. Kingdom seekers. And you know what happens when the, the, the spirit of God is manifestly present? He begins to do things you had no clue could ever happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he, Paul and Barnabas, I mean the churches of Antioch, they're praying, they're fasting, and then they came, they just came for a prayer meeting. And then in the prayer meeting, the, the Holy Spirit set apart Saul and Barnabas for me. And from that time on, a mission is launched from that church that changes the world. They didn't come to that prayer meeting to change the world. They just came to seek God. But as they're praying, their prayers become God. What do you want? God says, here's what I want. How many know that in this gathering, God ha can set aside some people? And God will set apart some people for missions that will change the world. Yeah, right here, right here in this gathering. Yeah, this is what happens. We start to pray God-centered prayers. Oh my goodness, may the Lord teach us to pray God-centered prayers. May we begin to understand the power we have. The Bible says, David says, What is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower. And that verse really means for a little time than the heavenly beings. That God made us lower than the angels just for a little time. And he crowned us with glory and honor. God does not move on earth except with the collaboration of willing human beings. The day you realize that, you stop praying baby prayers. You start to understand when he says, your kingdom come on earth, he's saying, you give me permission to interfere. I'm not, I'm not going to interfere. You tell me to come. You invite me. You command your house to receive me. When your prayer becomes in the morning, God, my house is an altar. May your kingdom come in this house as it is in heaven. May your will be done here. Not my will, not my children's will, your will. And your, your, chain, your prayer changes. And then God begins to, do, begins to do his will. And guess what happens as you seek his kingdom? All, all, all other things, they are added to you. I wish I had time to tell you stories of how that has happened in our lives. Yeah, I wish I had time, by the way. <laughs> No, I'll tell you stories. I'll tell you. Let me finish because this one I need to finish. Praying together breaks spiritual equilibrium. You're going to like this one. Breaks spiritual equilibrium. You know, an equilibrium is what happens when you and your enemy are equally matched. It's interesting because at the, at the life we're gathering, Pastor Bonnie talked about this. It's a powerful word. And this is actually a principle that is taught by, was taught by Bishop Doug. And he says, you know, whenever you find there's no war between countries, typically the reason is because they're equally matched. Yeah, that's why America cannot bomb China. <laughs> because they know, uh-uh, you bomb us, you bomb them, they bomb us. Yeah, as much as we have bombs, they also have bombs. And that's why the whole of Europe, nobody bombs each other in Europe. Because everybody has a nuclear bomb, <laughs> an arsenal. And by the time yours is landing, theirs will already be in the air. 
And sometimes what happens is there's just that equilibrium. So guess what happens many times in the spiritual realm? The reason that you've reached where you are, the limiting factor in your life is spiritual equilibrium. And, 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 and equilibrium just basically means that right now you've reached a place where the enemy can tolerate. The victory you're, explain, you're expressing right now in your life and you've arrived at is at a place where the enemy can tolerate you. So your church has grown but it's reached 200 people. And you've realized no matter what you do, you can't pass there. <laughs> you have a big outreach and 20 people come. And the next Sunday, another 20 have left. That's called spiritual equilibrium. You reach a place where 200 is tolerable to the principalities in the area. They can't tolerate you. There's a level of breakthrough you can't pass. The devil won't oppress you because he knows if he starts oppressing your church, you'll start praying more. And so he's like, let me leave them at the 200. They're comfortable there. But even you, you can't move beyond that place. That's equilibrium. Your giving stays the same. Your discipleship groups stay the same level. There are no sal salvations, maybe one or two. You're allowed those ones or two. One or two per month. You're allowed those ones. That's called spiritual equilibrium. You know, that first Samuel uh, 17 tells us of a time in Israel when there was an equilibrium. Because the army of Israel was camped on one side of the hill and the army of the Philistines was camped on the other side, on the other hill. And there was a valley between them. And at that place, for 40 days, they just shouted insults at each other. <laughs> you insult them, they insult you. And then you go back home. And you, 40 days. The whole, the whole army is being fed. The national economy is being drained. And you're just standing there looking at each other. And then you insult each other the whole day and then you go back and sleep. But nobody could move against the other. The Philistines had Goliath, which was their secret weapon. But you, have you asked yourself, why didn't they kill the Israelites then? It's because Goliath by himself couldn't do it. And so they were at a place of equilibrium. They were daring each other, but nobody could move. And then a young man called David changed the state of equilibrium. He took out Uber Eats, took out Goliath. And in one day, the Philistines were demolished. Where that equilibrium had been, it was completely destroyed because of this young man. Many churches are there where they are because of equilibrium. What's the answer, by the way? Pray together. Pray together. Stop praying just baby prayers. Start praying growth prayers for your church. Yeah, maybe you've not started praying prayers that break equilibrium. Start, make that a thing that you're all concerned about. Guys, we can't stay small. Why is our church staying only, when there are no unsaved people in our area? Is it that, that, that people have all gone to, the ones who are going to heaven are already saved? No, it's equilibrium. There are captives around us who are being kept in hell. So start to agree on the things that God is passionate about in your area. And watch the equilibrium break. Let me just tell you guys, the answer is prayer together. Prayer together. When you start to do things together, things begin to accelerate. I've seen acceleration in my life just in the place of prayer together. Whenever for me, I've gathered with others to pray, even in this church, even with my exec team. I've seen God do things that could never be explained unless by prayer yeah. things that I, I can't even explain have you ever, have you ever reached places where there's there are mysteries that you can't explain Paul says there are things I can't even tell you there are things I've experienced that I cannot even explain there are breakthroughs I've experienced that I can't explain and those breakthroughs have come simply because of agreeing praying in agreement together number seven praying together increases our sense of expectation our sense of expectation very very important there's something that happens when we pray together. A unified biblical mindset of faith develops. In the world, people pray without hope. They pray prayers of, <laughs> there's no difference between prayers and wishes. That's why I never sing, I wish you a Merry Christmas. What nonsense is that? I can't wish you, why am I wishing? I can bless you. I bless you with a, with a, with a blessed and happy Christmas. Yeah, why am I wishing? Uh, wishing is for people who can do... They say if wishes were horses, beggars would ride. The reason beggars are not riding is because wishes are not horses. I don't wish you, I bless you. There's a power in the blessing. So, so what happens is we get to a place where we begin, our prayers become like wishes. We're saying, I wish God would help me. In fact, have you ever seen people praying and then they're doing this? Uh, am I talking... Uh, it's, like, it's like I'm praying, but I'm also doing some superstitious things in the process. 
Fingers crossed. Praying. What superstitions are these we are bringing in the house of God? Prayer is not wishes. <laughs> Prayer is not wishes. You know, it's very interesting that one of the stories of prayer that is such a powerful uh, story, I mean, we talked about a covenant of prayer. Uh, Pastor Irene talked about a covenant of prayer. There's a story of communal prayer that comes from the 1700s. There was a group of people in a place in Germany called Henhart. And what happened is this group of people, they were under oppression, so they fled from their countries and they came to this place where there was a guy who had land. He was a nobleman, a German nobleman, a Lutheran. His, na his name was Count Zinzendorf. And he decided to host these refugees. And as they came into his place and he was hosting them, he just had the heart of compassion. And the, Cath the Catholic Church was really oppressing them. And so they had fled for their lives. There was a war that was happening between Catholics and Protestants. So he got them in and they, were looking, they formed a spiritual community on his land. And then, at one point, they had a prayer meeting. And in that time, they decided to make a covenant to do a 24-hour watch, prayer watch. And they agreed that they would have two to three people. Actually, I think it was three people praying for one in one-hour bands throughout the whole watch, 24 hours. So there are people praying at midnight, 1 a.m. Another group comes in at 2 a.m. Another group comes in at 3 a.m., etc., etc., and it's very interesting because they did this rotation and they did it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And these guys prayed, get this, not for one year straight, not for two years straight, not for five years straight, not for 20 years straight. They prayed for 110 years. For those 110 years, there was never not a person or people in the place of prayer. 110 years, every day of the year, every hour of every day of the year, for over 100 years. You know, because of these people, they, they, what happened is that God answered by shaking the, the, the whole world. The Moravians, you, don't, you, you might not have read about the Moravians, but the Moravian revival is one of the things that changed the world as we know it. Out of this small group of people, missions were sent out, the first missionaries, out of Europe that went into crazy places across the world, places that the gospel had not been to. They were so on fire for Jesus through that prayer. Some of them sold themselves into, selves into slavery. Like they knew that there were slaves in places like Jamaica. They were like, how will these people be reached? And their masters would never allow us to reach them. They went and sold themselves into slavery so they could become fellow slaves and so they could preach the gospel among the slaves. They went everywhere in the world. And as a result, they sparked off revivals. People like John Wesley, who started the Methodist Church and started the great, revive, the great awakenings in America and Europe. He became a believer because Moravian missionaries preached the gospel to him. The, the, the modern global movement was launched out of the prayer of that small community of people who covenanted to pray, and their prayer went on for 110 years. The devil's kingdom retreated because of this unified prayer. People, there's power in the amen. There's power in the in the amen. My goodness, Azusa Street Revival. There's no, by the way, there's, there's no revival that I can talk to, about, to you about that didn't start with concerted prayer. Just people coming together to pray together. And one thing that I can tell you is that the prayer of a righteous people is powerful and effective. And that's why prayer will always be at the center of Mavuno's culture. It's something that I'm committed to with all my heart. It will always be at the center of our culture. We will always take prayer together seriously. Not just individually. We'll pray individually. But we'll also pray together. And I'm excited to see our worship nights becoming such amazing places of worship. I love it. I love to see just how God's people, all our churches, that's become such a center. And I want to just encourage you. Let's keep inviting our friends and relatives and trusting God for miracles. We live in a generation when logic is not what will save people and bring them to Christ. It's signs and wonders and miracles. Invite them to come, and then let's trust God to do miracles in their lives. And we're going to see God do a mighty thing in our day. I'm excited to see the numbers of our 4.30 a.m. prayers growing. Oh, my goodness. I love it. Oh, wow. You're here. My goodness. This is Mavuno Bujumbura for you. Amazing people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they have some amazing prayers. By the way, in Mavuno Bujumbura, they're such a young church, but they've already planted in Canada. And they have a group of people who join them from Canada every morning for their 430 prayers. The power of the Amen. There's just something powerful that happens when we start agreeing together. And my prayer is that God will use this 
to just train us into an army. You know, as I've prayed about next year, I'm really excited about prayer. In fact, one of the things I'm going to challenge us is as we start our 21 day fast, by the way, there's going to be a 21 day fast shock on you. What a shock. So start preparing for it. Yeah, start preparing for it. So from January 8th, we're going to have a 21 day fast next year. But the first thing I'm going to do is as we fast, the first week at least, and for some of us it might be longer, for the first week, I want to challenge the whole church to not just do the liquid fast, but for us to pray three hours a day. Let's just take it to the next level. We're not doing eight hours yet. None of us is going to do a hundred hours yet. But we want to do three hours a day. I can see, I'm not hearing some amens from the back. Who can you Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just saying, listen, I think that God is going to do some powerful things this January. I think we're just about to move to the next level, people, as we agree together. And so that first week, we're going to actually, in fact, we're trying to figure it out with Pastor James, whether we're going to have some physical prayers here as well. Because I believe that God wants us to just put our amens together. For that fire to go up to heaven together, as we unify together, as we agree in prayer as one people. So please, if you have people that you've offended, just apologize to them. Because offense is going to destroy the power of the amen. Yeah? So come, come, just start to make peace. Start to make friends. If Pastor Kuria preached about someone and you felt he was preaching about you, just come and tell him, I'm sorry, Pastor. I've not been saying amen when you preach. <laughs> Don't let offense keep you from the things that God has predetermined for you. And let me just say this. I want to encourage you. I'm giving you permission. Start your own discipleship group prayer chain. Yeah, you don't have to wait for January to come. You can actually decide. Some of you have impossible situations in your discipleship groups. Don't just come to for that. You can even decide together. Let's start our own prayer chain. And actually pray around the clock. Maybe in January we should do a prayer chain for that week. And actually do a whole round the clock thing. And just cover as a DG. By the way, you notice there were not that many. But together cancer was healed. And who knows, maybe this December, some of you can decide the first week of deck, we're actually doing a fast when everybody else is starting to feast. And we're going to fast for one of us and pray for one of us. And let's see God begin to do something. But I believe that this, if we want to see God's blessing in our churches, if we want to see Jesus' transforming power, if we want to see the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit released among us, we must begin to look forward to learn to pray together. The power of the Amen. Tell a neighbor, there's a power in your amen. Yeah. Would you commit next year? Would you commit next year to be there for every 4.30 prayer that your network has? Commit yourself. And don't come to be asked to put on your video. Come early. And don't be those guys who show up at 5 o'clock prayer. There are no 5 o'clock prayers in Mavuno Church. Show up 10 minutes too and listen to the music. There's a reason why they put that music for you, by the way. Yeah. There's a reason why they put music for you. It's to set the ambience so that your spirit is ready to connect with God. Yeah. So. Wow. Commit yourself. Are there some people who are saying 4.30 next year? All of it. The whole year. I'm committing myself to be a prayer warrior. And even start this year and make sure you don't miss a single one. There's a power in the amen. Yeah. By the way, I want to challenge you to start fasting weekly. I fast on Thursdays. Uh, sometimes I do Thursday and Friday. And I want to challenge you. Pick a day and, and just start to fast as a DG. Uh, if you want to pick, pick the same day, I'd love for you to pick the same day as I do. I love it when people pick the same day. But if that doesn't work for you, pick another day. But let's agree. Let's just start to say, let's start fasting together. There's a power that happens. There's an amplification of our prayer together when we fast together for something. And it's not just about my prayers. It's about the prayers of the community.